Okay. Well, welcome to uh, prediction land, I guess, sci-fi or reality, what we will be eating in 2050. Um, you know, so is it going to be something precisely fermented or uh, small amounts of regenerate regeneratively grown meat, more veg and fruit locally grown, uh, factory engineered meat, you know, new crops. Um, what, will we, what will we be doing? But we have four people on this panel who've all thought a great deal about the food system and how to ensure we actually have a food system 27 years from now. And that doesn't seem to me today a given. Um, at the far end, we have uh, Catherine Tubb, who's research director of Synthesis Capital, and they are investors in companies making plant-based foods, precision fermentation foods, and lab-grown meat. Sue Pritchard is chief executive of the Food, Farming, and Countryside Commission and um, a leading light for us all, who has just, the, org the commission has just launched a nationwide public conversation on the future of food and farming. Malika Basu had the good fortune to be born in Kolkata, um, which is one of the richest, most interesting cities on earth, I think, and came here to do a degree in seems very unlikely, business studies, not knowing, as she says, how to boil an egg. Um, she's had a high-flying career in PR and marketing and business, but she gradually found herself um, cooking and writing food books, books, and she teaches food writing courses now at the British Library, as well as being a key figure in helping people understand the role of culture in cooking. Chris Mage farms a small farm in Somerset, and before that he taught social sciences at the University of Surrey. And in recent years, he's made a name for himself as the voice for farming on a small scale tied in to local economies. And his newest book that I'm very happy to have proof of, of is Saying No to a Farm-Free Future the case for an ecological food system and against manufactured foods. And you might be able to tell from the title that that is a repost to the eco-modernists, particularly to the eco-modernist that we all know, George Monbiot. So this is our panel. We're going to have, the way we're going to do it is we're going to have, each of them will have five minutes to set out their stall, and then we will have a discussion. And at the end, we will be very happy to take questions from the, the crowd. So, um, Catherine, do you, would you like to begin? <laughs> sure. Um, so when I think about, when you ask me what do I think we're going to be eating in 2050, I was actually a bit stumped because I was like, I spend so much time thinking about how we're going to be producing food that I suddenly kind of forgot what we're actually going to be eating. So I think just to kind of set the scene a little bit with what I do at Synthesis Capital and what I've done at other places is I think about technology a lot. I think about the role of technology. I think about technology disruptions. And I think about how technology is getting better. And what do I mean by technology? I'm kind of thinking about energy, batteries, electric vehicles, biotechnology, precision engineering, all these kind of words that get bandied about. But ultimately, these are quite words that you don't actually know what they mean. But when they come together, they kind of result in these disruptive products, businesses, and services that we know really well today what we look at what we have in our pockets, what we watch on TV, is all driven by these disruptive technologies. And so what I try and think about a little bit is what are we going to be eating in 30 years' time? Well, what happened in the last 30 years when we think about how far technology has come and what that's really resulted in us being able to do, we have to think that there's going to be things that are simply unimaginable for us today in 30 years' time in 2050. So 
what will these new technologies allow us to do, make, achieve, right? And I think that's what I think about a lot in terms of the food structure, but it's very much related to everything. Like, I, I know the word systemic thinking has been bandied around quite a lot today, and I do try and think about everything in terms of not just the food system, but the energy system, the transportation system, the information system, they're all very much interrelated to each other. So what's this actually going to mean for food in terms of these technologies converging and getting cheaper and better, right? Because we're not there yet, but we are getting cheaper and better. Well, it means that the production of proteins and fats will predominantly be in bioreactors and fermenters. This production is going to be truly delocalized, and I don't mean delocalized around the, like in, in farms, I mean delocalized in car parks, on top of supermarkets, in your back garden, that kind of real proper delocalization. And that's going to have huge implications for geopolitics as right. And then a kind of an advanced understanding of nutrition and food, that in 30 years we're going to have a much more better understanding of our nutrition and food system, what they actually mean. We've started today to understand that a little bit, but we still have a really long way to go. And what we're going to be, what we're going to eat is going to be unlimited in its potential. Today we eat quite a limited diet. You know, we have five animals, seven crops that form 75% of the world's food. I appreciate that everyone in this room is thinking about other crops, but that's how it is at the moment. But suddenly we're going to have unlimited potential. Darwin's favorite food was allegedly the Galapagos turtle. We may also be able to eat Galapagos turtles if we want to, or anything else, mammoths, if we wanted to. And then what are the implications of this? Because this is what we also spend a lot of time thinking. We come at it from a technology perspective, but actually like, there are huge implications in terms of the environment so, and everything else. So less land, less animals. There will be less animals, just as Mike Berners-Lee said, like we need to eat less animals because it's not that animals are bad, but their impact in the numbers we have is bad. Less water use. There's going to be these fewer animals and they're going to be a much smaller part of food production. But on the upside, what does that allow? Well, we have, we're going to still have farms, we're going to still have animals, but perhaps in a much more holistic way, the way we produce food, farmers are going to be allowed to do much more with the land that they have and give a little bit more freedom. And that's going to result in better agricultural practices, maybe more rewilding, as George Monbiot, I alleged, apparently is not very popular here, but may, it implies. <laughs> So how I think about technology is the inevitability of technological progress. Like farmers are the biggest embraces of technology that we have. All the studies around technology always uses farmers, by the way, as examples, which is incredible. But I think what we're going to see in the future is this real mixing of technology, of lab-grown food, of precision fermented food, mixing in with plants to produce food for everyone that's going to be better and ultimately cheaper. Thank you, Catherine. It's, it's too tempting, Chris, to say, you next. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should have gone after him. <laughs> so you're not going to resist the temptation? No, I'm not. No. <laughs> Me next. Um, all right, thanks very much. Um, I suppose I should start by saying I have absolutely no idea what we'll be eating in uh, 2050, but since I've written a couple of books with Farm Future in the title, I guess I be I'd better try and come up with something. Um, I think it depends a lot on how various trends um, that are not particularly related or only partially related to the food and farming system play out. Climate change is a key one and related to that energy futures. Um, uh, last year um, uh, uh, we used more fossil fuels than ever before. Uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from the energy sector were higher than ever before. Uh, if we can decarbonize um, energy production, I think that will take us in one direction, the, the direction I think that Catherine is talking about. I'm not seeing, every, you know, at the moment there is no transition. We are not transitioning out of fossil fuels. Uh, and so I think that's taking us into a, quite a tough place. Um, you know, there's other dynamics. Uh, water uh, is a big one. Um, but also politics. Um, I think you know we're at this. Uh, yeah, I think there's going to be some really tough geopolitics uh, going on globally. Um, you know, we, a lot of talk I've heard at this conference about Ukraine. 
Um, you know, I think that's going to be the new normal. I mean, you can just see all sorts of political conflicts um, around food, around water, um, around uh, inequality, around energy bubbling up worldwide. So um, the way I see that playing out is, is kind of two possible directions. I mean, I think a lot of the ways we've assumed, um, you know, this notion of progress, this notion of more energy, of cheapness, uh, Personally, I think that's, um, th that's not a trend that's going to persist into the future. But I think uh, governments and corporations are going to try and hang on to that as tightly as they can. So one way that will go, I think, is a lot of investment in, in new tech. I mean, my book that Sheila mentioned, I've looked at the energetics of precision fermentation, of, of um, uh, producing uh, high protein foods through bioreactors, bio through microbial fermentation. Uh, there's not, uh, uh, to my mind, there's not enough discussion of the energetics behind it. It doesn't look very promising to me. I think it's a very high energy process. So, you know, if we do have this a, a, a transition to as much or more energy than we're accustomed to in, in the existing global system, but low carbon, then for sure we, we might go in that direction. But I think the, um, you know, the other way it's going to go, I think, is that conflict, uh, you know, a great deal of cynicism amongst the general public about um, uh, the political process and centralized politics. I think that's going to get worse as governments kind of try and juggle with all the parameters that they have to, to, to deliver service to populations. Um, I see positive possibilities in that. I mean, you know, my, I guess my shtick is agrarian localism, uh, which I think is the way to go for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, it, it could be, um, you know, it could be quite negative. It could be positive. It all depends on how it plays out. But I think a way it's going to play out is a lot of hard conflicts over access to land. Um, I think uh, ordinary people, uh, people in their communities um, are going to start having to take more responsibility for producing their own food. When people do that sort of on a local community basis, they tend to grow a lot of fruit and veg, which I think is a good thing. I would say that. I'm a veg grower, but I think we need to be eating more fresh fruit and veg. Um, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting discussion about carbon and ruminants here. Uh, you know, I think we will be eating less meat. I think we need to be talking more about intensive chicken and pigs, really, and, and, and sort of rethinking that aspect of the meat industry, maybe more than ruminants. And you know, again, on a local basis, chickens and pigs are, are great as waste recyclers. Um, but I think you know, real tough politics you know, at the higher level, geopolitics over um, uh, you know, who rules the roost, but at the local level, politics over land. And I think farmers, uh, it's going to be really critical, the relationship between existing farmers, you know, particularly the, the sort of farmers that we have at this conference, people who are mindful of ecological practice, who are kind of tied in to local, often short supply chains, the relationships that, that, that you or that we have with um, the wider public is going to be really critical in terms of how that politics plays out. But what I hope is more fruit and veg, um, a little bit less overproduction of arable crops, and probably not too much of this kind of high tech stuff. And I'll stop there. OK, thank you very much, Chris. Sue, do you want to weigh in at this point, or would you want to rather? Up to you. Come. <laughs> So um, the first, my first response when being asked that question was to think, God, 2050 is such a long way away. And then I realized that that's only 27 years away, and my youngest daughter is 27. And I remember very well what we were eating as a family 27, 30, 33, 35 years ago. And frankly, it's not that different to what we're eating today. So um, for, all, for all the talk of technological advance, and possibility, I think the real question that we need to be leaning into and thinking what are we going to be eating in 27 years time are not technological questions, they're not really even agronomic questions, they're economic questions, they're questions about what kind of future do we want for ourselves and our children and they're questions that deal with the issue that we currently have a food system that is financialized as in 
many actors working out how they can extract as much as possible from the processing and um, uh, production part of the system. It's commodified and it's consolidated. And all of the problems that we've been talking about over the last couple of days, and many of us talk about a lot, are the direct results of market failures in our current financialized, consolidated, commodified food system. So I don't think the answer is, how can we financialize it even more? What else can we financialize? I'm not looking to venture capitalists for the answers to these questions. I'm looking to philosophers, I'm looking to communities, I'm looking to citizens for us to ask ourselves and each other, what kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of world is fair and just? And how can we respond authentically and with integrity to the question, how much is enough? How can we live, how can we all live within the Earth's resources so that everyone everywhere has enough good, sustainably produced food to eat? I think that's, that's the tough question. In my fantasy future, we will have faced into that question before it's too late, before some of the, the crisis responses to that question materialize, and we will have started to rebuild a different food system that deals with those current failures. And I'm very, as a small farmer myself, and a small farmer that um, actually can live very well, not moving too, you know, not moving too far from where I live. Ten mi in 10 miles of my farm, I can get pretty much all my basic needs met from local shops, local producers. We've got a local brewery. I mean, that's me sorted. We've even got a vineyard being planted. So that's me sorted for the next 27 years. So building, building local food systems where we take more responsibility for ourselves and our community, what our community needs, growing more of what our own landscape can sustain without um, extensive inputs and intervention, and doing it in a way that is in harmony with nature, that deals with the climate crisis, but also, crucially, of course, recognizes what we already know about what we need for our health and well-being. And finally, which brings joy back into food, joy and conviviality. Food, as we know, is at the nexus of some of the biggest challenges that we face as a society, as a generation. But it's also a central part of the things that give us joy, our celebrations, weddings, birthdays, all the things that we love and appreciate have food playing some part in them. So in my future, 27 years away, not that long, hope I'll still be around by then, we will have a food system where we have dealt with the economics of the food system. When we talk about systems, we often forget to talk about the economic paradigm we're operating, but we will have lent into that. And in doing that, we will be eating more of the food that we know makes us healthy, keeps us healthy, gives us joy, gives us pleasure, and at the same time has acted on the climate crisis and the nature crisis and the health and the equity crisis. And that is really easy and straightforward and it's within all our grasp. Well, Malika, I mean, you have, you major on joy, but you have some very interesting thoughts about the food world that is perhaps not local. Well, exactly. I thought I'd take you all um, global for a minute, if I may. Um, and the reality is that we're inspired by um, the tastes and flavors of many different communities around the world, diverse communities, cultures, and this is a great thing and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Now, I'm a bit of an eternal optimist. I feel like I must apologize for this. Um, but I think that we do have a bit of an extractive and exploitative mentality, mindset, when we source our ingredients, our products, 
and our produce from overseas and from different cultures and communities. It tends to be all about the taking, uh, not enough about the putting back and giving back, and we really need to get better at that. Now, not everything can be grown in the UK, we know that, I mean, it'd be lovely. I live just off Brixton, by the way, in central London, <laughs> so I'd love to have a winery near me, but you know, these things are quite challenging, urban centers especially, um, and where supply chains can be shortened, they absolutely should. I'm a big believer in that. Um, but where they can't, we do need to think sensibly about where the food is coming back and what are we doing to put something back into those places. Now, there are lots of positive examples. I've been chatting with Hodmidouts uh, this morning, Josiah, and they have a lovely, I mean, they grow everything here, and it's a wonderful company. I'm sure you've come across them. Uh, but they recently had a trip to Brazil. They saw firsthand the devastation soya growing had caused in the community, and they are now selling Brazil nuts on their website, which is directly from the Kayapo people of the Amazon, and you buy it, and the proceeds are going back into the community, and it's really enabling them, not only enabling the community financially, but actually putting something back and raising awareness of some of the problems they're facing. So one of the things that, um, Sheila, I should have mentioned is um, I ran an artisan premium spice brand for a bit. We all use spices now, cooking now. Um, and the thing that really annoyed me about that was that the same people who buy the very best quality meat and fruit and veg will then go to their local supermarket and buy absolute nonsense spices, <laughs> you know, filled and bulked with all all sorts of rubbish, like you know, rice flour and all sorts, and they're in jars that you can't get measuring spoons in, and there's no thought about the impact of those spices from wherever they came from. And you know, there are artisan spice producers doing brilliant things about that now. There's, I met these, these brothers-in-law who run a farm called Bow Tree Farm. Has anyone come across them, by the way? Bow Tree Farm, no? Um, so one of them actually has a, a farm producing spices in Kampot in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. The other one lives here, he's in Scotland, and they sell over 30 different spices that are sourced from plantations where the climate, the soil, the know-how, everything adds up to the very best quality spices, and they're not cheap. They're expensive as they should be, um, which was wonderful, um, wonderful to see. The other thing that's very positive is that the way we live now, we live in a morally and socially conscious world, and so there's a lot of awareness of where these crops, where these products are coming from. Del Monte, their pineapple farms were in the press recently. Um, lots of human rights violations, they're looking into that. We all know what's happened with palm oil, you know, deforestation, that's been in the news, and a lot of food writers are now saying in their recipes, if you're going to buy palm oil, buy sustainable, which is wonderful to see. It's quite mainstream, the awareness of that. Cashew harvest, so cashew oil has an acid that actually um, disfigures fingers. And someone took a photo of that and popped it on Twitter at the start of the year, and it became like huge. People just got really aware of stuff like that and why you should be buying good quality, expensive cash nuts. Um, I went to Mike Berners-Lee's um, session this morning, and he actually said, think about all the people, not just of ourselves, as a bubble of people on an island. And I thought, yeah, here, here. This is good, isn't it? So um, we can't talk about diets of the future, of course, uh, without mentioning the superfood phenomena. So we love a superfood in this country. Um, I come from a culture, I grew up in India, where all food is super. If you get food, it's super, <laughs> yes. So just shut up and eat your food, because that's super. Um, but you know, we do this thing in the West, where you know, something just becomes really hot, really mm. trending, and then everyone's cottoning onto that. So in 2013, the UN declared quinoa a superfood. So I was married to a Peruvian for a very, very long time. And Peru has some 6,000 different varieties of quinoa, superfood, nutrient rich, you know, climate resilient, all of that good stuff. This year, the UN has named millets. It's the year of the millets, basically. So we're gonna go through that whole thing all over again, like we didn't learn anything, right? So the good thing is, of course, that people are writing about it. You know, Moringa Bay, there was a piece, uh, lots of Indian newspapers have picked this up, because you need to be doing these things, cottoning on to an ingredient, to a food product, but also thinking about community-centric models, things that don't just extract, but put something back. Avocados, I'm not going, gonna go into. Did Tommy, Tommy Myers mention avocados? 
book out as yesterday, by the way, mm. when she was here. Look, finally, I'm just going to say that migratory patterns and diasporic moves means that there will be more diversity on our planet in 2050, um, not less, I think. And the chances are that those people from different backgrounds and cultures are going to be settled in urban cores and centers, right? So um, they're going to be very removed from the realities of agriculture and rural communities. It's just the way it works. And the countryside also isn't the most inclusive of spaces. It can lack representation. So we need to be joining up some of those conversations, bringing people into these conversations from different cultures, different backgrounds, uh, different classes, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, which I think you have today with me, for which I'm very grateful. And that's me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Malika. Well, my mind is a bit concentrated because I, I spoke earlier today at a conference about climate change and the food system that was organized by RAP. And I was supposed to kind of be the, set the agenda for this, um, for this thing. And as I read widely, including a lot of what Sue has written, um, it just, it seemed to me that, that in so many ways we're avoiding the, the central issue about money. And this, this I, mean, I mean, your ideals and, and what you're saying, Sue, and all of you are, you know, this wonderful future in some ways, and, and you're asking the right questions. What life do we want to live? But how can we live that life when we have a food system which is controlled by a small group of global corporations who all work within this financial economic system that outsources the cost, the cost to the planet, the cost to our health. You know, this all began under Reagan Thatcher in, in the 80s. And we've now, it's like become a religion. It's like, you know, that's just the way it is. Unless we have a, unless we change our economic system, how to incorporate nature into it? And why would any of these highly um, powerful corporations who have um, budgets bigger than most, you know, that half the planet, the countries, how, would, how do we even begin to change that? I mean, they're all, they make out like bandits from the system as it is. What is going to, what is going to change things? Sue? I mean, that is a really, really good question. So um, I don't think there are very many bad people in the world. Really no, not that absolutely, many. no. And the people that lead those corporations aren't getting up in the morning and thinking, how can I trash the planet? At least most of them aren't. They are getting up in the morning and they're saying, how can I keep my business going? How can I make sure that I still you know, provide products into the market that keep my factories going? How can I give shareholders value from the investment they make in us. The sorts of questions that you're asking are questions we've got to ask not just of the food system, but of the energy system. And many of the manifestations of the kind of capitalism we've ended up with in the last couple of hundred years. You're right to say that it is taken as a given. And I, I made the point in passing, but it, I'm reminded over and over and over again, when I sit at in places like this, and I hear people talk about systems, they talk about climate systems and nature systems and food systems. The economic paradigm that we're all operating out of, the, the, the assumptions, the taken for granted assumptions about how economies work is so taken for granted, it's really rarely questioned. But that said, people like Kate Raworth and Tim Jackson, and even the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, who I spoke with at a conference a few weeks ago, are all saying that's the question that we as a society have to face into. Now, it's true that those corporations um, are, not, uh, are not enjoying the scrutiny that they're getting. And the questions that we are all now asking in society, we're asking of them in a really tough way. But I think it needs, it needs, it needs a couple of things to, to happen. First of all, we need to collaborate across nations on the basis that this is a problem that affects all countries everywhere. So we need to foster and support the global collaborations that hold particularly the global corporations to account. 
Second of all, we need to build an awareness and appreciation amongst citizens everywhere, that it doesn't have to be like this, that they can express not just choices as they run up and down the supermarket aisle on a busy Friday night, but they can use their voices. They can use their voices in the ballot box, they can use their voices in their local communities. They can be part of creating the alternative system that fundamentally undermines it. And I think the last big thing that's quite tough for us to think about is that when we talk about a just transition, we're gonna to have to talk about what it means to transition away from those big corporate conglomerations and how we help those countries, those, those companies, basically die a good death. You know, help, them, help them come to an end. We're really rubbish at talking about death as a society, but helping things end and end well, hospicing the old as we're midwifing the new is central to these, these conversations. Castro, how would you reply? So I think there are bad actors in every area, right? There are bad financial actors. There are good financial actors. I would like to think that we are trying to do something good. Now, some people may interpret that differently, right? But some people interpret that the food system needs to completely change because that's how we're going to solve climate change. So for me, from the point of view of if we have an urgent question, which is solving climate change, Food is a really important part of that, and I think we don't want to get to the point where essentially because we haven't solved it, we're forced into an area, and that's ultimately the heart of where, the, where we look at and what we're trying to do is to say, hey, you know, we can do this another way that is less impactful. Sorry, the data is on my side, Chris. I, I can have a discussion with you about that after. It's less impactful for the environment. And this, for us, is the quickest way to get there. And then everything else can kind of sort its way out. I mean, yes, on the conglomerates, they have so much power. I totally agree. But there are lots of companies in our space that really are not interested in the conglomerates. They are really coming at it from a very mission-driven perspective. So I think I don't have the answer to that because I'm part of the financial system. Boo. But I, I like, equally, I do think there are good actors in the financial system as well. And I don't think just because there are some bad actors, we should all be kind of tarred with the same brush. Malika? Well, I just think I'm going to talk about the cultural problem we have, is that people just don't care enough. You know, you see that with climate change, there's a real kind of bury your head in the sand and it'll go away because the con it, it, it is a horribly depressing conversation and it's easy for people not to care. And so power gets concentrated in very, very small, powerful hands and the vast majority of people just, they've clocked off. You know, they don't care anymore. Engaging people in that conversation, putting care back into what's on your plate, what are you consuming, why, where has it come from, how it's been produced. I think we need to make these things more a regular, you know, part of our conversation. I've heard some amazing sessions today, and you know, there are children in schools now being connected to farmers, and they can actually learn about farming. My children's school, a state school in South London, they did that. They had a wildlife garden in their school where they went and they saw fruits and vegetables being grown. They used to sell it at a local farmer's market at harvest time. We just don't see enough of that. And unless people, there's a cultural shift and we improve our relationship with the food we eat, what we're putting in ourselves, I just think you know, it's, it's gonna be difficult. Chris. Um. Yeah, well, to build on that cultural point, I mean, my background as a social scientist is as, as, as an anthropologist and not as an economist. And I guess the way I tend to think about it is that people are great at inventing symbolic systems which kind of buy us out of immediate um, physical interaction with the world um, and money, capital. Is the, uh, is the one par excellence in, in the modern world that creates all this huge kind of global flow. Um, ultimately, I think it, it, we, we can only sustain it. I mean, I wrote a blog post recently about lawyers paying themselves 300 quid an hour. You know, ultimately that's sustained on a fossil energy economy. And, you know, it, it tends to hit the, the, the buffers of, of reality when, you know, when we can't buy ourselves out of physical reality energetically. The difficulty in answering it, and I, I talk about it a bit in my book, I think um, in human systems as in ecological systems, um, high energy systems tend to disrupt. You know, you get low energy tight cycling systems, you get 
organisms that are very well adapted to niches where you know there's not much to there's not much energy there's not much food but they're very well adapted to getting what they need you know by cleverly uh, playing a local game and I kind of argue that's what we need to do as humans but it's very difficult to do that when there's a, a, a bigger symbolic system a bigger energetic system that keeps kind of trampling it um, my view is that it's going to emerge out of um, sorry to be doomy uh, uh, various political energy and climate crises but I think it's a matter of long-term cultural change you know it's not something we can just say overnight oh right um, the money system, not great, let's do something different. I mean, we can do that, we must do that, but I think it's, it's only going to emerge through long-term cultural change as we readjust to different physical, uh, biophysical and, and, and ecological realities. Um, I'd like, I mean, my next question really is, is about what you said, Malika, which as the, the food industry, as it now is, has created a multi-million, billion audience for its food. It's, um, and as we know, 55% of what we eat in, in Britain is ultra-processed. And we learn all the time more and more evidence, almost week by week, of what damage that is doing. I mean, you can calculate you know, the level of a country's consumption of ultra-processed food, levels of disease, they match. So in, in the interest of research, I went into Tesco on the way here, and I saw that the meal deal, I, which I used to think, I thought was a meal, turns out to be a <laughs> chocolate bar and a yes. Coke and, I don't know, pack of crisps if you want. Anyway, there is this, as you say, you know, people don't care, but you have surrounding you this astonishingly cheap food and which is sort of addictive it's very comforting and I'd, I'd say sort of under 35s you have got a captive audience who are just used to eating this sort of stuff and without thought and I was making a program in France three weeks ago and one of the very great differences in the children I spoke to there 12 13 year olds was they seemed to understand there was food and there was junk they liked junk but they knew it wasn't food we don't have that we, we and I think in the United States and possibly in Australia and New Zealand and you know you've just how do you how do you rebuild how do you start to say this isn't food, and it's, you know, we have to do something different. I mean, this is a question to all of you, but... I mean, I can go first. Oh, go <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I'm currently doing a piece of work um, looking at how the investment in electric vehicles, um, like what happened around investment in electric vehicles, and is there a pathway around investment in alternative proteins? And I think what's been really the main standout for me was the impact of legislation. Like, especially, it may, my, bear in mind I'm doing this work based in the US, basically the legislation around number of sales of electric vehicles has basically pulled all the car companies into that direction. And essentially it's just driven investment from the government, mainly from the government, but then pulling it along from all the companies in there. And I think there is a real role for the pol political agenda to set the way. The problem is anything around food is such an, a, a touchy subject, as I think we've all kind of discussed here, and I think agreeing on what that legislation looks like on how we push it forward has been like really difficult. Even like the sugar tax, right, which is something that you know took a long time to come through, but came through is still touchy. We have to kind of embrace those really difficult decisions and legislatively, because I think that could be so key, so key to really kind of dragging companies in line, basically. I think you're absolutely right. Setting, setting boundaries around the bad things is absolutely essential. Of course, we want to um, inspire people to do the good things, but we need to be really clear about saying you can't, you can't make that stuff. This isn't, this isn't a, it, it's not for citizens to fix the food system on a Friday night when they're making food choices. These are big systemic and structural issues and they need to be treated as such and they need to be legislated and regulated really effectively. But I just want to pick up what the, the, the what do citizens think piece because we're, we're asking that question right now in the big food conversation that we've just initiated in the last couple of weeks and we're going to go right around the country to really test that 
um, proposition that we hear over and over again, people don't really care, people just want cheap food. If they didn't buy it, we wouldn't make it. People don't really care about the climate and nature crisis, and you certainly can't care about it in a cost of living crisis. I don't believe any of that is true. And I don't believe that's true because I talk to citizens all of the time as part of my work. We produce a field guide for the future. We work in communities all around the UK. We work with the poorest communities around the UK. We produced a report last year working with big local, 150 of the poorest communities in the UK, funded by Local Trust, who funds them, and talk to them, partly in relation to the response to COVID, but also how food uh, can be uh, liberated and deployed as a way of building dignity and, uh, and well-being and connection in communities. Those communities have got brilliant ideas. They have all the creativity, all the ideas. They have all the knowledge that they need. They do not have the resources to deploy to do the right thing in the way that they want to. So what we keep hearing over and over again, citizens don't care, and if they cared, we wouldn't be in this situation, I think is nothing but a marketing narrative that we have been sold for the last 30 years to persuade us that the business model that extracts more value from the food system is our fault, not their fault. And that's what we're gonna be pushing back over the next six, nine months. And, you know, these are tricky conversations mm. to have. Mm. Food poverty is very real. Yeah. I mean, I you know, and it is. And there's often the will, but not the means, mm. you know, especially now in the current economic climate. And one of the things I do notice is a complete lack of food education. You know, when we were small in a lot of ethnic minority communities, you were basically made to chop vegetables and peel garlic because you had small fingers that worked quickly. <laughs> you know, that's what we did. We weren't allowed to go out and play until we helped in the kitchen and did things. And before you leave home, you're taught a certain number of recipes so you won't go hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, these are essential skills, learning to cook, learning to chop, peel. And you see that really, you know, we're losing some of those, those ways, just getting simple, not very expensive ingredients and turning them into something amazing and wholesome. Some of those are really getting lost. So I do think that there is a need for a bit of food education and actually engaging some of those communities how did they do it? You know, we're still doing it. We're still cooking our recipes that our grannies made. So what's happening there? Chris. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would reiterate my point about long-term cultural change, but from the low base that you say of, of, of the meal deal, and I think it is worse in the UK and than just about any other country in the world. I mean, just two very quick anecdotes from my holding. We have forest school teachers who take kids who are on the point of being excluded from school for misbehavior, they come and do forest schooly stuff on our holding. And uh, you know, when I interact with them, I'm like, oh, these are supposed to be the naughty kids. You know, they're just so engaged with um, everything that's going on on, on the site. Likewise, uh, you know, m most weeks we have someone that visits the site and says, oh, this is great, I'd love to, can I live here? Can I, can I do, do something? How can I get involved? You know, when I had an office job in London, nobody ever asked if they could come and uh, spend the day with me in the office. And yet we have this narrative that, oh, you know, there's this buco bucolic idyll, nobody wants to farm anymore, nobody wants to be in the countryside. And we have this kind of economic ideology of consumerism that, that you know, that, that cheap price drives uh, the right economic outcomes. It's not true. We all know it's not true. We just have to build that up culturally. Well, I think we've uh, reached the point where we might have some questions from the audience. Um, there's a microphone back there. And... There's a hand up at the back, right at the back. Yeah. Okay, there's a hand where? Right at the back. That okay, there. hand right at the back. I couldn't yeah. see it. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. What does supermarkets look like in 27 years' time? So I, I can see a future where supermarkets come back into communities. With that, that, that shift over the last, is it 20 or even 30 years, of the huge out-of-town supermarket that tries to meet everybody's needs, I, I don't see those having, uh, having a plausible future because they are so embedded in the economics of scale. 
And if we're going to address those issues, then we have to think about you know, what, what will shops look like. I, one of the things that I've been um, researching a bit more recently, and, and, and I confess it was a bit invisible to me, having, having taken on board, really, this narrative that says it's either the big supermarkets or it's the artisan food market, is to research more into what's going on in that middle space, the co-ops, the spas, the corner shops. And I've been having a little look at what they've been up to quietly and a little bit below the radar for the last few years. And they are building a, a cooperative, um, resilient, sustainable supply chain. It's early days, and I don't want to kind of big them up without having done more research, but I'm really intrigued to understand how new players in the system, or existing players developing new models in the system, are starting to build resilience by doing things like um, supporting farmer cooperatives, supporting more local supply chains, getting healthy, well-produced food into the corner shop into your everyday corner shop rather than expect, you know, having to go to the supermarket for the range and variety. So I, I, can, I can see a future, where I would like to see a future where we revitalize high streets. And I would like to see a future, my, my fantasy future in 2050 in urban centers as well, means that things like fruit and veg and uh, you know, tree, tree fruits and so on are everywhere are in the streets, in the landscape, on rooftops, in window boxes. So there's much, much more free food, easy access to free, healthy food in the places that need it. So I think there, there are all sorts of um, promising prospects, actually, that are already, um, they're, they're already in sight that we can imagine uh, might develop further by 2050. More questions? Oh, yes, here. And we have another one here. Thank you very much. Very interesting hearing such different views in such a short space of time, what could be our futures in 27 years. Um, I respectfully ad admire all of your views. I very much hope we do not have Catherine's future. That terrifies me. And Sue, I absolutely hope we have your future. Um, having having uh, everything you need within 10 miles um, and having eating real food that we understand feeds our souls, feeds our health, feeds our children. I really hope that's where we end up and not trying to manufacture something that we know nothing about and we know nothing about the long-term health of our, of our world with that. But um, you, my question is around, we, we've talked about you know, going back to the old ways, using the, our granny's recipes that I like to think we all have, that's great. How do we set policy to incentivize people to do just that because it seems to be the opposite. What can we do so we're not leaving those choices to the people who are struggling to think where their next meal comes from? How can we incentivize that to be the direction that we take? Good question. Uh, that's a great question. I, uh, we had a national food strategy which, uh, as we know, has not gone very far at all. And there were some really good points in there, to be honest, that should have been incorporated. But I think generally there's a view that, oh, that's too hard, so we'll just leave that there. You know, we, we won't go in there. We won't get involved. And th there needs to be some proper systemic and structural changes in the way people relate to food, the relationships they have, have to food, whether they see food growing. So I know a chef, Chef Mike Reed, and he's from here but he lives and works mostly in Australia at the moment and he had some children come into his chef kitchen to learn about cooking from like chef Mike Reed TV chef and they could not recognize carrots and onions it's still happening today and so unless there's something that really changes from when we're very, very young, how we look at food, recognizing vegetables, eating fresh fruit, those things are just, you know, it's going to be very, very hard because we can't leave it. Unfortunately, we can't leave it to our politicians as we now know. Um, I, Catherine, I think it's rather unfair. I mean, I, as though you, you know, you're just longing for a future where you, grow, you eat lab-grown lab meat the whole time. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, cooking counts. Yeah, no, I mean, I, to be honest, it makes me really sad to hear you say that because I, when everyone's talked, I've nodded in agreement with many of the points that they've made, by the way. And I think 
when we think about, when I think about what we're doing, we are looking very much at meat for a start, and a lot of the conversation has been around fruits, vegetables, spices, which by the way, you know, are most of what we eat. So when I think about it, I'm thinking about like the meat, and I'm just saying, take the animal out. We don't need the animal, it's just a vessel to make meat. You may not agree with you, me on that, but that's, that's kind of what essentially like we're looking at doing. And you, yeah, you may not agree, and that's completely fine, but that's what we're saying. We say, hey, the cow is a technology, it's making these meat and proteins, how can we do it more efficiently? And so, you know, that ultimately also leads to a change in the food system, which is very much a localized food system. You know, you can make this stuff anyway. You can make meatballs on top of IKEA if you wanted to. So I feel it actually fits in really well and is very complementary to a regenerative system. I appreciate that everyone gets very like lab grown. I don't like it. I don't want it. I don't want you to take away anything. And I don't think of it like that. So I'm hoping over the next 10, 20 years that opinion changes. Um, but it may not, right? And that's just something that our industry will have to continue to work on. And perhaps the answer is more with you and no one ever wants to eat it. Or perhaps the answer is more something else and people really start embracing it because it tastes good or the same. So, and by the way, it's here, right? You know, this is not, some, this is, this is not a future that is not here. This is being made and eaten in the US as we speak. You know, the big news last year about the, last week about the USDA uh, letting basically loud grown meat onto the stage is, that's happened. So it's here. So you may not agree with it, but it's here. Question coming from over there. Um, what we eat in 2050 will depend entirely on the population's understanding of food, what is good food or what is bad food. You've got, got to let the individual decide that. The only way that's going to happen if people understand about cooking, the only way you'll get to understand about cooking is if we can get cooking back as a core subject in schools. Every child needs to know how to cook. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the Fife diet, do you remember that? The, in Fife, a few years ago, there was this attempt, it was an attempt to set up a local food, you know, that 80% of the food you ate would be grown within 25 miles, I think. But one of the things that they were proposing, that every child, by the time they left primary school, would know how to cook, make soup. Because the Scottish view, and I think it's quite right, is if you can make soup, you can live for the rest of your life. You are, you can free yourself from the food system because it teaches you how to do a lot of things. Anyway, the Fife diet. More questions over there, far wall, please. Here. Sorry, and then we'll come back here. Hi, uh, Dr. Lucy Williamson. I'm a nutritionist. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, get your quick opinion, but I do feel there's a fundamental point um, here, which is when we're talking about the food system that's going to sustain us, it has to sustain human health. Obviously, we're, it needs to sustain the planet. But when it comes to animals, so I should just say my, um, my joy and my passion is around gut health and the microbiome, so totally connected with soil and food and understand the importance of plants in our diet. However, currently in the UK, I mentioned this earlier and I apologize if anyone has heard me say this before, 50% of our teenage girls are lacking in iron. But that's a serious statistic and iron is very difficult to get from plants. So there is a reason that we need to keep animals in a regenerative plant-based system and that's what we need to be educating the public on, that's what we need to be communicating is these helpful, vital um, facts for our health. So it's not just about what's the right way to produce food that's going to supply enough calories and is going to look after the planet, it has to sustain our health. Dairy is the best source of calcium, meat is the best source of iron, those are crucial nutrients which we are, um, it's extremely hard to get from plants and I'd just like to hear your opinions on that if there's time. Chris, do you want that? Sure, yeah, I mean I think, um, 
you know, a, a low energy input local system, um, livestock are really critical in that. I mean, I've done some projections in this book about a kind of mixed farming system with, you know, dairy looms large in that and using livestock, um, you know, as waste cyclers and, you know, the, 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 there's, you know, a huge amount of ecological work that we, um, you know, either livestock do it for us or we have to do it ourselves. Um, so, you know, I absolutely think there's, a place for meat, um, uh, sort of ecologically um, as, as, as well as nutritionally. I mean, I do have concerns. I'm not a nutritional expert. It's not really my focus. I do have concerns about um, single cellular protein uh, 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 in various ways uh, nutritionally. But I think, you know, we can have a, um, a, a, a healthy diet that's, you know, good for us, good for the gut. and. Um, you know, and is and is ecologically sound as well. But you know, we have to put that power into. You know, we have to get away from a kind of consumerist mindset of what are we buying on. You know, in, in sort of long global supply chains and sort of develop real kind of food cultures locally, where um, you know where we produce good food that fits into a local ecology and gives us kind of feedback nutritionally and ecologically. You know, we need to. You know, we need to become the producers basically. Um, there was a, someone here, right, who wanted a, was there? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was very pleased, but sorry, I think you're far too optimistic on your views for 2050. It's only uh, so close. Um, do you feel I'm wrong thinking that the children's lunch boxes are just going to be full of Pringles with added vitamins? Hmm. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's definitely a risk. That's definitely a risk and unless we decide to um, uh, legislate and organize differently. But I, I think I, wa I, I want to respond to your question as, as well as respond to the lady's question over there. We, we have to be able to tackle multiple crises simultaneously. We have to be able to tackle the climate crisis, the nature crisis, the health crisis, and the crisis of equity. And we do that by asking a different question. Not, what can, not how can we extract more from the planet that we're on, but how can we live in harmony with nature, uh, in a balanced planet, and how can we live well? How can we all live well? So we have to ask ourselves different questions. What's, what is enough? what is good enough and what is enough for us and what is enough for every, everybody. So I suppose, you know, what, what I'd like to do is see no more billionaires. How much money does any human being need? Let's tax billionaires out of existence and let's use that to fund free fruit, veg and healthy food for every child everywhere. My children never no, had, oh, sorry, sorry, I was going to say, my children never had Pringles in their lunch boxes, let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, and their school didn't allow it. Their school was a healthy school and no one was allowed junk food. When their lunch boxes opened at lunchtime, this is a state school in South London, their lunch boxes were inspected and any suspect items were removed and the parents were written to. And I think this is a policy that should be adopted across the nation. <laughs> I think you could start a political party that would do quite well on them. <laughs> no billionaires anymore. <laughs> no billionaires. No billionaires. Anyway. Hi, I'm Fran and I actually am involved in Groundswell, but um, I just wanted to invite the audience to give a round of applause also to Dr. Catherine Tubb for actually having the brevity to come here <laughs> on stage, the courage, an audience that is completely probably anti everything you're talking about, because I think that takes guts. Um, I do think the audience should give her a round of applause. And <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I'm so pro region and everything. I have the most optimistic, ideal views that we can all get our food from farms. But having a conversation with you, Catherine, at a point where I was like, I don't want this, I don't want you to be on stage. Um, I realised that there, on a global stage, you know, um, there are cities in the world where they don't have land to grow food and they do have a lot of ultra-processed food. And when you explain to me what precision fermentation is, and that actually, I come from New Zealand, and there is very intensive dairy there, and a lot of that dairy, that milk, goes to whole milk powder that is sold to China and ultra-processed products. And I can see where perhaps there is a place 
for precision, precision fermentation to go into those products because they're not going to go away. And I can see the impact that that is having on my country. And so I think it's about being curious. As to, oh, this isn't a question, it's just I wanted <laughs> to say and that there is a curiosity that we can all have to see where this sits because um, it was yeah, eye-opening for me to have that conversation with you. So thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, Fran. We've actually come to the end, and I'm, I'm glad that you said that. I mean, I think everything that's been said seems to me really thought-provoking, and that's what Groundswell is about, right? Provoking thought, changing the future. Anyway, thank you for your smart questions. Thank you to the wonderful panel. Thank you for Catherine for being so <laughs> brave. And uh, that's the end, so thanks. Thank you, thank you Sheila.